back on our study this evening. We will continue um, in Daniel chapter 11. I'm quite aware that it's a tough chapter, but it's a critical chapter. And we are going to wrestle with it until the Lord gives us clarity and until we understand. Where we are going to pick up this evening is on page 53 of your new book. I'm not going to be following the new book because there are some details which I need to establish in your minds certain principles and truths which might not be as detailed in the new book. But it will help. It will set a foundation on which we can build as we continue in our study. So right there at the top of page 53 verses of Daniel 11 verses 30 and 31 is where we are going to continue this evening. Before we continue, let us ask the Lord to be our guide and our teacher that we may learn His ways, His lessons. Our eternal Father and our God, we gather before you this evening again to study your word upon the Sabbath day. Pray that you will guide and teach us and open our minds to these truths to guide our feet so that we do not slip and to help guide the feet of others. We live in a time of gross darkness. Even among your people, the darkness is uh, beyond explanation. So teach us now, we pray, and bless our Bible study and our worship before you for the rest of the Sabbath. We pray and we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our dear Savior. Mm -hmm. Amen. Our, our foundation text is Daniel 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. In the days of these kings. Which kings? The kings of Europe. Uh, the kings representing the feet of iron and clay. While they are trying to set up this one world kingdom. Right. Once again, to make it pure clay or pure iron. In the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. Babylon is long gone as one world kingdom. The elements of Babylon are still with us. So is Medo Persia, Greece, and the pagan Rome. We are in the feet of iron and clay. It is in our time, therefore, that God is going to set up his kingdom. I say that because I keep hearing people say, God is going to. This is going to happen. And I am looking at it in the past. It has long started. It has been going on for a long time. So we need to stop looking for things in the future. It is here. Almost everything is here. In Daniel 11 and verse 30, the word says, For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Um, from your text, you are going to see that we have certain elements to address. One, the ships of Shittim shall come against him. We studied this in the past. And we look at it again. He shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Return and have intelligence with them that forsake 
the Holy Covenant. Let's look for these elements in our study in the historical record and in what God has revealed to his people. The prophetic narrative still has reference to the power which had been the subject of prophecy from the 16th verse, namely Rome. The hymn we are looking at, Keep Your Eyes on Rome. Look at his relationship to God's holy covenant and we will and God's people. And let's see the prophecies fulfilled. Is in the, is indignation against the holy covenant. This refers to attempts to destroy God's covenant by attacking the holy scriptures. God's covenant is found in his scriptures, the book of the covenant. This was accomplished in Rome. No other entity, no other kingdom has attacked God's covenant and with as much success as Rome. The Hurulai gods and Vantas who conquered Rome, we discussed that last week and the week before, embraced the Aryan faith and became enemies of the Catholic Church. It was especially for the purpose of exterminating this Aryan heresy that Justinian decreed the Pope to be the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. So Satan creates a problem, creates a solution, and in the process flies in the face of God's uh, standard. Who is the corrector of heretics? Go on, Bertrand, do better than that. You should, that one should flow from your lips. Who is the corrector of heretics? Christ. Christ, through the instrument of? His word. His Holy Spirit. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, what will he do? Lead us into all. He will lead us into all truth. And he will convict the world of sin, sin and of and righteousness and judgment. He will point out sin in our lives and he will point us to the truth. How many mistakes have I made? I used to be a champion of the cause at Northern Caribbean University of uh, Jesus coming in sinless flesh. Me? You? Yes. <laughs> Heresy. The Bible soon came to be regarded as a dangerous book that should not be read by the common people. But all questions in dispute were to be submitted to the Pope. Sounds good? Nobody's talking to me this evening. Absolutely not. Too much lasagna. <laughs> Thus was indignity heaped upon God's word. To subject God's word to this man. If you were a moral man like John the Revelator, it would be one thing. But quite, they stood at the very other end of the spectrum. I have a question for you. What are some of the actions Rome took to destroy the Holy Covenant? From the time we're studying, you should, should be able to easily let these flow off your lips. What are some of the actions Rome took to destroy the Holy Covenant? Change the law. Attempt to change the law. Create a new worship day. The covenant is enshrined in the commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is the only passage in the Bible which explains Explicitly identifies who the creator is, who the law giver is. Yes. The authority belongs to this man and only because he is the creator. Mm -hmm. yeah. Satan says, let's change that. What else? Feast days. Feast days. What else? Come on, Virgin. Eros, come on, you know them. They drop number two from the commandments and double up number nine. Exactly. 
um, the, the, the worship of um, no statues and thou shalt not bow down gods before me, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. He has changed all of that. The most popular day of the year. Come on, let's have it. Christmas and Easter. Communion. Baptism by sprinkling, false doctrines. I think this world intoxicated with the wine of Babylon. Rome provided an infallible interpreter, the Pope, whose duty it is to take care that the Bible shall not express nothing hostile to Rome. Sounds good? Self defense? Adam, what did you do? Eve. Yeah. Eve, what did you do? The, the serpent. Rome, what did you do? Not me. Satan did it. The Pope is there as a protector. To protect Rome. Don't say anything bad. Sounds like Adventists today. Point out the evil. You are church bashing. What I'd like to ask these preachers today across Adventism. How do you meet God's requirement of cry aloud, spear not? Lift up your voice like a trumpet and tell the house of Israel their sins? How do you meet that one single requirement in any ministry? I don't care what you call yourself. Inside, outside, in between. Do you meet this requirement? If not, what do you do with uh, the admonition to Timothy? All scripture is given by inspiration. All of it, not a part. It is profitable for doctrine, instruction, reproof, or correction in righteousness. Which part of that scripture do you excise and file away somewhere? Rome has placed the gulf of tradition between them, the people, and the word of God. Tradition. It's another one. She has labored by all means in her power to prevent the scriptures coming in any shape into the hands of her people. Robbing us of the scriptures. It was written for us, Paul says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Before the Reformation, she kept the Bible locked up in a dead language, Latin. A language nobody uses, nobody studies, nobody understands. And severe laws were enacted against the reading of God's word. Sounds like she's working in favor of the Bible or against it. The Reformation unsealed the precious volume. Tyndale and Luther sent forth the Bible in the nations in the, in the vernacular tongue of England and Germany. So here comes the Reformation. They take the Bible. They started printing it in the language of English and German and sending it off to the rest of the world. Praise God. For those who say that the Reformation is over, I would like to go on record and say that it started with one man and it will end when the last man has given up. Not until then. The Reformation do, do, uh, does not need the praise and acceptance of great men, countries, the state, laws, and so on to be with us. A thirst was thus awakened for the scriptures, which the Church of Rome deemed it prudent openly to oppose. There she is having indignation against the Holy Covenant, against uh, that which God has given to his people. Continued hostility against the Bible. The Council of Trent enacted ten rules regarding prohibited books. The Bible which was insidiously framed to check the growing desire for the word of God. The Bible had that list. 
of prohibited books. One would think that a church would want the world to have the Bible. In the fourth rule, the council prohibits anyone from reading the Bible without a license. Do you have a license? No. They didn't rescind that law yet. <laughs> Elder Pinot, did you get your license? So how dare you read that book? <laughs> and that license must come from his bishop. Maybe that is why you have one, because he didn't have a bishop. Or the inquisitor. That license is to be found on a certificate from his confessor that he's, no, he's in no danger, this is so ridiculous, of receiving any injury by reading the Bible. As long as the inquisitor or your um, confessor can certify that you won't be injured by reading the Bible, you can have a license. That means you're bona fide, brainwashed Catholic. You won't slip or slide by anything you see in there. Yeah, many, many bishops, storefront bishops and and. Um Prophetess is out there. Maybe you can ask any one of them. Any little store for Bishop Joseph and Prophetess Norma. You find them all over. The for a license. I'm not. I'm not applying for one. I'm going to remain illegal because they might, the license they might give me might have some restrictions. You know, like you get your driver's license that you can drive cars and vans, but not these big trucks and so on. It had been Rome's policy under a profession of reverence for the Bible. So I don't like profession. Because you can profess all you like. You can appear to. You can dress the part. You can talk the part. You can profess to be a Seventh-day Adventist. But until you are converted, until you are led of the Holy Spirit, you are just a professor under a profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked up in an unknown tongue and hidden away from the people. Under a rule, the witness prophesied clothed in sackcloth. But another power, the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to make open a bold war upon the word of God. So up to this point in verse 30 of Daniel 11, uh, that wasn't sufficient. To lock it away is one thing. But you know what? Let's have open war against it. Because that's, that's not working too well. By the time of Constantine, the large body of professed Christians had forsaken the Holy Covenant. Today, most Seventh-day Adventists are no more than professed Seventh-day Adventists. They are not. We don't have to judge them. Their open display. State who they are, Sister Laura. The church once pure had gradually departed from the uncorrupted simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of the church fathers, such as Justin Martyr and Oregon, write down that name, do our research on him. Is the one why today you need a master's degree and a doctoral degree to be a pastor in the Seventh day Adventist Church. In order to be a minister of the gospel, hallelujah, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. You know, it's amazing when God says something. And people come along and say otherwise. No, let's turn to chapter 4. And someone start reading uh, at verse 8, please. Let's have a mic. Do you have a mind, sister? Is it Ephesians 4? 4, 
8, starting at 8, yes. Do you have a mic? When he ascended, ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Who are we talking about? Satan. Jesus. Are we talking about Jesus? No, Jesus. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Who ascended on high? Who led captivity captive and who gave gifts to men? Jesus Christ. At his ascension, he took the keys from death and the grave. The keys he was trying to tell Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The keys he said to John, John, I have the keys of death and the grave. Don't be afraid to die. Don't be afraid of being locked up in the house, Sister Yoli. I have the keys. Just call me when you're ready. I'll come and open it for you. And when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. What are these gifts and what were their purpose? Yes, it's done. Read again first. Um, eight or nine. Um, nine? Nine. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Verse 11. And he gave some apostles. He gave some what? Apostles. What are the gifts, brethren? Yes. Some apostles. Do we have to go to Northern Caribbean University, Andrews, Oakwood, so on, etc., to be an apostle? No. No. It's a gift from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Did he give up more gifts? Yes. Some yeah. prophets. Some prophets. And some evangelists. So, Sister White, with a third grade education, could qualify as a prophet, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Praise God. He didn't exclude her, she didn't need a PhD. And? and some evangelists and some evangelists do you need a master's phd doctoral bachelor's of science degree or arts to be an evangelist you're not talking to me this evening no we can go out right now and be evangelists if the lord bestow that gift upon us any more gifts and some pastors and some pastors too and teachers wow so i have some hope yes. i could be a pastor yes. i don't have to graduate from Andrews. No. you sure sister natasha yes. absolutely Absolute. so how did these men bring in this system of philosophy that you need a doctoral a master's a bachelor's degree in order to be a pastor So I could very well be a pastor and I don't even know it. You can learn well from the Jesuits. <laughs> Why? And some teachers. Why? For what purpose did he do this? Sister Lord. I, I guess he wanted the, the work to be done. He wanted the work yes, to be done. He wanted, and he wanted us to um take part in the world so he, he was this gifts he blessed us with his gifts. the church gradually departing from the uncorrupted simplicity of the gospel of jesus christ some of the church fathers such as justin martyr and oregon proposed that the christian church needed the wisdom of philosophy are you seeing the root of philosophy? That is why I can say, I don't want to hear your good uh, arguments, your sound speech, your, your reasoned um, 
application. I want to hear the word of the Lord. I want to hear thus say the Lord. Look where they got their philosophy from. And they needed the wisdom of philosophy and science to defend its faith before the world's great men. Look, look at God's word. God's word needs some help. God's word, Sister Pino, needed science and philosophy to help it along. If it weren't so, Sister Pino, why are we using it? Why are pastors hastening on to PhD? You need to be Dr. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so. Doctor of philosophy. Isn't about that what PhD means? Yes. Yes. Philosophizing. Reasoning out using philosophical means. To defend its faith before the world's great men. At that time, the world's center of philosophy was in Egypt. Good? You're not sure. But, of all the places, let's go to Egypt to help God. You sure? So, if you all right, Sister Yoni. How come we got Andrews University accredited? How come we took our university to the world to, to say, look at our educational program. Help. Bless it for us, help us. and help us. Mm -hmm. Send us some of your professors, Catholic, yeah. infidels, otherwise, to Andrews to help train our ministers so we can have good ministers. <laughs> Is that what we have done? And are doing? From Alexandria, the church began to receive its greatest teachers. Is it any wonder we are in this mess called the mystery of iniquity, the mother of hearts? Do you see the fruit of trying to use men to do God's business? When the fruit is ripe, when the fruit is ripe, you get Revelation 17. Turn to Revelation 17. That is the product of this embassage of God's word, God's men, into Egypt. You end up with the great war of Revelation 17. You make the church a prostitute instead of a virgin, pure, without spot. The mystery of iniquity. That's what you get. Egypt. This is what Egypt stands for. Someone read verse. Exodus 5 and verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Two things. I don't know him, and I will not let Israel go. Defiance. Don't bring God to me. I don't know him, and I am not going to obey him. That is where the great men went to learn to do good spiritual work, to learn good church work, to learn God's business. Where should we have gone? Huh? Ephesians chapter 4. He gave some gifts. Some apostles, some teachers, some evangelists, some pastors. 
This. The great city in whose streets the witnesses are slain and where their dead bodies lie is spiritually Egypt. Of all nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his command. The great contrast of page 269. No monarch, monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven than did the king of Egypt. When the message was brought to him by Moses in the name of the Lord, Pharaoh proudly answered, Who is Jehovah? Forrest, who do you think you are? Hey, I, I deserve that. I'm a nobody. Who do you think you are, Forrest? I know not Jehovah. Moreover, I will not let Israel go. This is atheism, Sister White says in the Great Controversy, page 269. This is atheism. So we have taken our ministers to atheism because we are still doing the same thing today. And the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. France during the French Revolution. It doesn't it bother you that our leaders don't seem to know this? Sister, Sister Lori, talk to me because I, I really need you know some. I don't, I don't get it. I'm not joking. I'm not preaching. No. I'm just telling you, I don't get it. Don't they know this? You can't do God's business by your power and your might. It's there in the Bible. Gideon, 28,000 men, too many. Um, God, we are going up against 85,000 million. Gideon, too many. Send back all those who just married or don't really want to come. Send them all. I don't remember the number after 28,000. God says still too many. Tell you what, take them down to the river. Let them drink as they run to war. Anyone that bends down and lap up the water like a dog and not grab the water and cast it into his mouth as he's running, send them all. Now we are down to 300. Yeah. 300. Um, one more thing. Don't take your swords. <laughs> uh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Sister Lori, you have 85,000 armed mad Midianites down there we are going against. Are you telling me no sword? <laughs> 300 men? So, uh, okay. What should we take? A battle torch? Or a fire covered under a pitcher? And a trumpet? And that my signal? Break the pitcher, release the fire, and start blowing your trumpet. Is that any way to go and fight 85,000 Midianites? What do we call that? Madness. Madness. Yes. That's, a suicide That's what we call it. Madness, yes. brother lady. Suicide Jericho. March around. Blow your trumpet once every day. And on the seventh day, march around seven times, blow your trumpet seven times. Is that any way to conquer a city? So our ministers should have understood by now. Let's do one more. David. He's going up against Goliath. He's young, probably 70, maybe 80. Resume. 
taking care of sheep. Success in defending sheep against lion and bear. We are going up against Goliath now. Uh, take these weapons. Um, no, I, I've never used them before. I don't know how to use these. Uh, what are you going to take? I, I take my slingshot. Your slingshot against a seasoned nine foot warrior, probably weighing 300 pounds of raw muscle. Are you trying to tell me, Brother Henry, that our ministers have not got the lesson yet, enshrined in these experiences? That tall forest without the armor of the world can go up against any power that defies God and defeat it in faith. Yes. Yes. They don't get that yet. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It gives us little wishy-washy hope. I can stand and tell you today, Sister Silva, that you can defeat the enemy because your power is the same power that defeated Goliath guided that stone yes. sending a message to David you took four stones too many mm -hmm. you needed one only one the same spirit that created confusion among the Midianites and let them wipe out themselves is the same power available to us today God says I will not give my glory to another so Greek philosophy won't work Alexandrian philosophy will not work it cannot work it is to give the glory to Satan it doesn't work it cannot impossible God will not let it work it's not of him Oregon was born in 8185 in Alexandria, Egypt, and became the greatest Christian teacher of his time. He applied himself to the study of Platonic philosophy, Greek philosophy. You've heard of it, right? Plato, Plato. Being convinced that it was necessary to win the world's great men to the Christian faith. Isn't that what we are doing today? Church planting, raise up a church, doesn't matter how, just get a church going. And so you have any and everybody in this big mixed multitude, mixed in the church, were deceived, worshiping Satan, thinking they are praising God. That's what's happening. That's what's happening in our church. He shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. As this most ingenious man could see no possible method of vindicating all that is said in the scriptures against the cavils of the heretics and the enemies of Christianity, provided he interpreted the language of the Bible literally, he concluded that he must expound the sacred volume in way in which the Platonists or those of the philosophy of Plato were accustomed to explaining the history of their gods. Is that how you explain God's work? Huh? No. So what's our method? What is our method? How should we? How did Jesus do it? By prayer. Huh? Prayer. 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 By prayer. Constant communication with his father. By prayer and by the thus say the Lord. It is written, Matthew 4 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord. Take it. Or leave it. That's it.
when we want tithes and offerings, we build churches. I don't know if we should call them churches because it's a gross perversion of the world. But when we win souls, we preach the gospel. Whomsoever will make come for this gospel of the kingdom shall be preaching all the world for a witness. A witness. Then shall the end come. God doesn't force anyone. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It is written. That's it. In his book, Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns, Dr. E. A. Sutherland shows that the papacy had its foundations in Platonic philosophy, imported from Egypt by the fathers of the church. It was this corruption of the church that led to the union of church and the state. Unless the leaders of the church had abandoned Jesus Christ for the wisdom of Plato, there could never have been a papal system or a medieval church whose educational system was wholly based on Plato and Aristotle. If they had not done this, we would never have a Catholic church today. And the history of God's church would have been very different. This is what happens when we do it our way, not God's way. Many have forsaken Christ their leader and have turned back to Egypt. In times of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Israel's faith in our God was so weak that instead of seeking divine support in the crisis of threatened invasion by Assyria and Babylon, she repeatedly turned to Egypt for succor, for help. So also, when the early church lost faith in her divine helper, she turned to Egypt to obtain weapons in the battle for the minds of men. Let's go to Satan to get some power to win men to Christ. Let's send our children to Satan so he can educate them to work for God. To play? Isn't that what we do? In his book, Fathers of the Catholic Church, E.J. Wagner, shows how the church fathers, enamored and captivated by the learning of Alexandria, led a large segment of the church into Egypt. It is interesting to observe that at that time, Alexandria was both literally and spiritually in Egypt. You know the problem we have with Ellen White? Tell me. Why do we have so much rebellion against the writings by our scholarly world? Too much truth. Too much truth. Too much truth. Too short a degree. No degree. You want to tell me the leader of our church is a third grade um, educated um, person? No doctor? No. Sister Nati, Tasha Nati, you have a bachelor's? Not even an A.C. Is this the fact? Not even an A.C. Or a high school diploma. But does it fit a pattern you've seen already? Yes? yes. No? Yeah. Tell me. The Bible writers didn't have PhD. The Bible writers didn't have PhD. Jesus himself is not have a no college degrees. This is why it was so surprising to them when he was in the temple answering and asking questions. They, yes. were, them. they were shocked. But let's say he was a genius. <laughs> so he didn't really need school degrees. He was just brilliant from the start. No, you have to do study. You have to do much study. But don't you see a pattern in David and Goliath? 
Huh? Gideon and the Midianites. Don't you see the same pattern? God using the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Don't you see in that your destiny? You that they reject as the offscoring of the earth. And my said, huh? They won't listen to us. They won't invite you into Congress or me. Right, sister of the Lord? Yeah. But if we are faithful, what will we be doing? Huh? If we are faithful, what will be our role? We will be pronouncing judgment upon them. We will be sitting beside the king in his throne. The stage is set. Repeat of verse 13 our day. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. That's what the servant of the Lord says. Has it been repeated? Is it still being repeated? In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. The Ten Commandments, so shall it be do. It is reasonable to conclude that those with whom the kings of the north, the king of the north, the papacy, has intelligence are those among God's denominated people who have forsaken the Holy Covenant. That is, quit demonstrating allegiance to God and Him only by their disregard of his counsel, his will, and finally, his law. I'm getting tired of saying this now. I'm, I've said it so many times. I've said it so many times. It is so clear. Having intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant means that there will be dialogue with those who forsake the Ten Commandments, which we covenant with God to keep at His baptism. You saw it last week. This Dr. Frederick, I don't remember his last name, preaching to our ministers, telling us that God has removed the middle wall of partition. There is to be no division between us. And he's saluting our ministers for ha having the audacity to come and ask him to come and are helping to remove that wall. Yes. Yes. Seducing Israel yes. into sin. Yes. So what am I supposed to do? Broken down the middle wall? <coughs> Removing the rules? God will change, he has to. Why wouldn't he? Do you see how blessed I am to be where I am today? Amen. Amen. Huh? Oh my goodness, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I don't know if you know what I'm feeling. The joy, the peace, the weight. Not that I've attained. I still have battles to fight. For me and the brethren. But to have some clarity in this darkness is priceless. Because there was a time. I've told you my testimony before. And I'm going to ask you to give your testimony this evening. Because the servant of the Lord says we should end the Sabbath giving God thanks and praise for what he has done for us. I am standing in church, Sister Yulia, tears running down my cheek. I'm looking at the service, and it, it, it just can't be. Something is wrong. It's that like I don't belong here. The rebel in me is not submitting to God, and I need to go and be a vagrant. 
or the spirit in this church is of the devil and I need to get out. It's not working. And I said it. I said, God, this, this is not working. I can't be there and there's a woman in a tight pants, tight fitting pants, preaching to me and all her body parts is showing. Something is wrong. It's not the first time. It's not the second time. And I said, Lord, the jacket won't fit. I'm going to take it off. And I believe that it is your spirit that is moving. Because this is not righteousness. The underwear of the high priest goes all the way down to his knees. Yeah. You get that? His briefs. That's just his underwear. And this girl is in this tight-fitted, figure-hugging pants, standing before the mic. Says so she's preaching. Thank God. Thank God his spirit was moving inside of me. I, I couldn't drink it. And I did not. Praise God. Ephesians 5.11. Read with me. Okay. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather improve them. This is another guiding text that I'd like to ask every Seventh-day Adventist preacher out there. How do you reconcile your ministry with this passage of scripture? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You're called to reprove them. Huh? How? According to inspiration, God's people should not have intelligence with Rome or her daughter. The woman of Revelation 17, the Great War, nor any of her daughters. Regrettably today, there are forsakers of the Holy Covenant who go ahead and encourage this intelligence. This is seen in various ecumenical dialogues that the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists has held with the Catholic Church system. The Lutherans, the Presbyterians, and other fallen uh, Protestant church systems and organizations having dialogue with them, trying to work out a deal. For instance, in 1998, and this is the part I like about the Daniel chapter 11 study, after a while, it moves away from history and it becomes current affairs. You see it as clear as crystal, the Seventh-day Adventist church made an agreement on justification of faith uh, after four years of dialogue with the Lutheran church system, a church which has rejected the fourth commandment. Righteousness by faith. Someone turn with me. Psalm 119, verse 179. My tongue shall speak. That's it. Thy words. Speak it loud, Elder. Get a mic there, please. Put it on Psalms the record. 19, 119, 172. My tongue shall, tongue shall speak of thy word. For all thy commandments are righteous. What's righteousness, brethren? All the commandments. God's commandments are righteousness. How do you have dialogue and come to an agreement on righteousness by faith? Rejecting one of God's commands. What does James say if we reject one? Guilty of all. Can you be a thief but tell somebody to keep this out? Rubbish. So we have dialogue. And agreement. <laughs> a church which has rejected the fourth commandment. The next year, 1999, the Lutheran Church made a similar agreement with 
Roman Catholic Church system, the mother of all of Revelation 17.5, on justification by faith. The rule in algebra is if A equal B and B equals C, then A equals C. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Huh? Yes. yes? If you have one pound of sugar and it's equal to one pound of flour, and the one pound of flour is equal to a pound of of meat, then the one pound of sugar should be equal to the one pound of meat. Yes. 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 If we have an agreement with you on justification by faith, and you have an agreement with them by justification by faith, it must be that we also have an agreement on justification by faith. Unless somebody is practicing duplicity, if what I share with Sister Lawrence is the same thing Sister Lawrence share with Elder Sinclair, it must be the same thing between Elder Sinclair and I. Yes. Yes. Whether we have a formal agreement or not, if you believe the South, and I believe the South, and your agreement with Sister Lauren is the South, it must be that Sister Lorena is in agreement as well. Yes. It's the same thing. <laughs> so we are coming closer home now. What makes us do these things? Huh? What is it in God's remnant people? It must be some outside corrupting influence some Jesuit infiltration because otherwise we would be crazy. But where is that one Elijah to stand up in the general conference? Where is that one true prophet of God to stand up and say something? Even if they kick him out, he would have said it already. What we are doing is wrong. So here comes the Vatican marching inside of our general conference session and everybody's laughing and everybody's grinning and everybody's happy and walk out if i can't get to a mic to address the forum i am not staying there in all my life i've been to one general conference session and i vow that never go back because I'm not going to be a part of this. Unless I go as a delegate where I can do something, vote or speak out or say something, I would never take part in such a worship. Because I am convinced this is not pleasing to God. Verse 31. It took us nearly an hour to cover verse 30. And we have not exhausted it. But the Lord said to me, do not rush. If you don't finish, so be it. But God's people must understand that when the liars speak, you must have some foundation in you to know that they are lying. Not just because somebody saying they are lying, but you must see and understand where they are coming from. I don't have many friends who are ministers of the gospel, and by now you should be able to figure out why. Not because I hate them, but surely, if this is where you're feeling, I don't want any of it. Don't, don't tell me, don't share with me. Keep it. And the arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. That text should not have sacrificed. The original Hebrew does not. Um, they're trying to help the text along, so they supply these words because the Hebrew just doesn't have certain kind of language in there or punctuation. So it's not meant to be vile. They're trying to make it plain. And most times it works, but sometimes it does take away the real meaning from the text if you do not have um, the clear and clarity that God intends. 
and the arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. There's a story going around. I have a, I have a copy in my, of it in my possession. Where the daily, in some stretch of the imagination or interpretation, means the Roman temple. They shall take away the pagan part of Rome and replace it with the papal part of Rome. That is a magnificent understanding. But from scripture and from previous studies in Daniel and Revelation, using the principle of repeat and expand, nothing new, from Daniel 1 all the way through 11, it's repeat and expand. This daily must be the daily in Leviticus and Numbers. What shall they do daily? The instruction was given to the priest. Daily, you trim the lamps. Daily, you make sure the showbread is in good order. Daily, you make sure incense is in the center, representing the prayers of the saints, mingled with the intercessory work of Jesus. Since Jesus embarked on his ministration in the most holy place of heaven, the sanctuary, and more so uh, in 1844, he has never taken. So the lamb on the altar outside, which is changed in the afternoon, roughly about three o'clock, and then again in the morning, represents Jesus' continual work of ministration before his Father on our behalf. So I don't have to worry that Jesus fell asleep and the wrath of God may consume me. And that is why it is called the daily, the tamid, or the continual. It is continual ministration on our behalf. No pause, no break, no holiday, no break vacation. In the two o'clock of the morning when you wake up, you can fall on your knees and send up a prayer and you are assured that God hears it because Jesus is ministering on your behalf. So let's see what they did. So the arm shall stand on his part. They shall follow the sanctuary of strength. They shall take away the daily. They shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Let's see if we find that in history. Exodus 29, verse 38. Will someone read, please? Read with a mic. Exodus 29, we start at verse 38. 38, 38, 29, 38. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. What, brethren? Day by day, continually. Does it sound like the daily? No. Huh? Yes. 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 Day by day, continually. Do not stop. 39. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at eve. 41. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at eve, and shall do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering thereof for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So the incense, the offering, the drink offering, the meat offering, do the same. 42 and 43. This shall be a continual good offering throughout your generation. A what? Throughout your generation. A what? A continual. It shouldn't stop. This is a type of Jesus ministering on our behalf. Continually. 
For how long? Your generation throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. So, right before the door where I will meet you to speak with you, you must have this service going forever throughout all your generations. It must be done. Verse 43 And there I will meet with the children of Israel. Uh huh. Tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So God is going to meet with them and He is going to sanctify them. So here comes, let us uh, let us change that. Let's um let's let's put in something. You know, Greek philosophy, we as we said earlier, uh, 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 it will meet the needs of the scientific community of great men. And all the wise men of the world. We look good. We will sound uh, educated. We will sound as if we are scholarly. And modern. So like university people. Not like third grade people who claim they have inspiration. From what we are not so sure of. The union of church and state here described me in the same the sword of Caesar, the weapon of the church. The arms of the state were wielded on behalf of the papal hierarchy. Arms here stand as a symbol of physical power, generally. It means that he will set physical force in motion on behalf of the papacy. The papal church has always defended the right to use the sword of the state to further her ends. So if they won't accept it, we will enforce it. We will use the state to enforce it. Sister White says this is the image of the beast. When Protestant churches begin to do this, use the force of the state to do what they please. Now we are hearing a lot of talk, not about the word of God, but about church policy. If you don't abide by church policy, we'll deal with you. In AD 494, Pope Gelsius I had presented to the Roman Emperor the papal view of world governance. This is how we are going to do it. This is how we are going to govern the world. The view involved two swords or two powers ruling the lives of men. I don't know if you saw that article this week where the mayor of New York says, your bodies belong to us. We can do with them whatever we please. We can vaccinate them as we please. We can take your babies and stick them with eight shots one time if we please. If they get autism, we'll consign them to a requisite facility. The view involved two swords, the civil and the ecclesiastical, the state and the church, the royal and the sacred. One will note the ambitious symbolism for the church, not a shepherd's staff, which is what they present the Pope having when you see their version of Jesus. Duplicity. They hide the real system and they put forward a front, a pleasing one. They give him a sheep and a shepherd's staff. That's what's in their painting. Those paintings are European. It's coming out of here. But a conqueror's sword Apostolic servanthood was set aside for equivalency with a king, no more than, no, rather, more than equivalence. Servitude. How did the apostles live? Kingly? Servants. 
But no, these men are the power brokers of the two swords the Pope wrote. The responsibility of the bishop is more weighty than the king, insofar as they will an answer also for the kings of men themselves at divine judgment. We have to answer for you, kings, so we are higher than you. In other words, as author J. Uh, Michael Miller wrote, the two swords theory maintained that secular leaders were subject to the Pope's spiritual authority. Is it so today? You see where it came from now? See how it gradually morphed into this thing that they present to the world as a beautiful picture. Give us your lives. We will take care of it. We will make sure you get into heaven couldn't be further from the truth. God never promised to explain all of this to us before he saved us. He never promised that we needed to know all of this in order to be saved in this case. He called us to believe in him. To trust in him. This system has changed before your very eyes this afternoon. One step at a time. From one thing to another. Yet the gospel of Jesus Christ has remained the same. He doesn't change its claims. He doesn't modify them. They're always the same. The two swords view and the presumptuous title, Viper of Christ, were a proclamation of the papal intention to be king of kings. That's where they headed. Rule over all other earthly crowned heads. Now that you see, power is greedy, you know. Power is greedy. Power is never satisfied. They fought for power in the church, they got it. Now they wanted to have power over the world. They have wealth, they have glory. But what do they want? We want the entire world. Indeed, the triple crown worn by the popes exemplified the papal claim to superior status. It would be only a matter of time and patient insinuation in matters of state until the way would be open for the church to exercise her assumed responsibility in the affairs of state. Give them sufficient time and they will get there. The arms of Justinian shall stand on his part. In 534 AD against the Vandals. Among those who adopted the religion of the Roman Catholic Church was the most powerful barbarian leader, Clovis, King of France. By his support, the priesthood of the Roman Church was fully established in AD 508. So the priesthood side settled. They have no rivals on the side of the church. Let's get the side of the state now in line. That's what they're still fighting for today. To get the world under them now. The civil side of things. While the union of church and state under Constantine led to the gradual formation of the papacy, it was the support of Clovis, king of France, which established the powers of the Roman priesthood in 508. They got a state power to establish themselves. Justinian, the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire, established the civil power of the papacy in 538. The word rendered arms is from the Hebrew word zero, singular, which properly means the arm, especially the lower arm below the elbow. The word is used repeatedly to denote strength, might, power. In verse 15, it means military force. The text undoubtedly referred to the Roman church being invested with the power of the state, the arm of the civil government. Are we speaking truth? Do you see the church empowering herself by being lord of the state? So now we are in Europe. Europe officially becomes Catholic with this move. 
Clovis had become the first Catholic king of the ten symbolic horns of Western European Empire. So the first of the ten is in place. Who is it? Clovis, king of France. Hmm. Uh, from 476 AD. This ascension to the throne in 508 brought in its train the first instituted national religion. What does Sister White say about national religions? Turn to your... Remember, I'm a... I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, I am a... As it is written, man. So you, you gotta give me something. Do you know where to find the book Upward Look? On your phones or your other ins your other um, mobile devices. It is under devotionals. And the title is Upward Look. October 28th. Yes. To be singular. Take a mic, please. Let's read some of what it says there. Take a mic, sister, sister, please. Take a mic. So to want to stand apart just for the sake of being different or standing apart is what? Detestable. Detestable. But? Below the dignity of a Christian, but to be singular, because it is necessary to, to be so as the results of worshiping God and Him only places heaven's heavenly dignity upon them. Places what? Dignity. Heavenly dignity. To stand alone to worship God properly puts heavenly dignity upon such a one. Carry on, sister. We must not be afraid of being singular when duty requires us to be thus to exalt and honor God. Do not court singularity for the sakes of being odd, but for the sake of avoiding sin and dishonoring to God. And in this case, we are not to mind even the multitude who are against us. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Because, because the law of God is made void in our, in our world, does it make it a virtue to transgress that law? It may appear to the world a very small matter for the Christian to be in harmony with the world by just the act of keeping Sunday for the Sabbath in the place of the seventh day. But God's word says the seventh day is my holy day. The man of sin says, I make a Sabbath for you, and you must keep the first day of the week. God has a church. God has a church. It is not the great cathedral. It is not the great cathedral. Neither is it the national establishment. Neither is it what? The national establishment. Neither is it the national establishment. So when Clovis empowered the church and made France Catholic by him being king, 
And what I say goes around here, and now you're all French people Catholics. That is not God's church. It cannot be. It is not the national establishment. It's the word of God. Clovis can't make me a Christian. You can't make all France Catholic. It's absurd. It's foolish. All other faiths were outlawed. Then began the long chain reaction in prophetic history until every European nation accepted the one and true Catholic faith and was led to follow the example of the France in using the civil power to enforce the church's dogma. One by one, all of Europe, those ten kingdoms, became Catholic. We are at the other end now. Where they're fighting to get back together. There isn't any longer ten. There's now seven. Because three became extinct. But now the seven is fighting. And they have a problem. You know the problem, right? Brexit. Brexit. Follow Brexit, brethren. It's prophecy. Working right before your very eyes. God says they shall cleave themselves one to another but it will not work this is a beautiful piece of prophecy that is in my mind every day any day the european union succeeds in establishing one government in europe then i believe them until then don't talk to me go fix your brexit first go fix europe get those ten kingdoms under one you don't have to worry about black people and India. They're all Caucasians. They don't have to worry about racism. Why can't you do it? Why can't they do it? Huh? You can't answer me? Prophecy. God says no. He'll stick his finger in some Moses Tayoli and mix it around. It will not work. That's the beauty of prophecy. I have been watching this, um, this, this show since I was but a youth. Watching Europe. Let me see them fix it. They can't. Well, they did it once. Why can't they do it again? In order for the arms of civil entity, in this case, the arms of Clovis, the, to stand or to have allied itself on behalf of another, that of Catholicism, it is only done through a legal process. They didn't do this willy-nilly. They created laws by which to achieve this. Therefore, legal documentation will be that just such legislation will be found in the books of the legal code of the day. This documentation will cement the accuracy of the scriptures and the union of church and state that they have so cordially set up in the year 508. Some hold the view that the sanctuary here referred to is Rome. He, they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. <laughs> you know, this one is so absurd. Um, I hear great men saying it, but you know, sometimes when we don't lean on scripture, Scripture and spirit of prophecy, we say that lead us astray. They hold the view that the sanctuary here referred to is Rome. But is that biblical or supported by either the spirit of prophecy or history? They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. If that sanctuary is are the Roman pagan temples, you tell me what's wrong. They shall uh, pollute the, the that's what the text says the sanctuary of strength they are already polluted how do you pollute a Roman pagan temple the bread basket of pollution the strength strength and beauty are in 
his sanctuary. Psalm 96 and verse 6. Where is strength and beauty? Do you see why the word call it the sanctuary of strength? Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. True or not? Absolutely. Have you ever seen the description of God? No? You tell me. Where? Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Anywhere else? No, it's physical beauty. Have you ever seen it? Yes, I Where have you seen it? I hear Revelation. You can? Turn to Revelation chapter 4. Who's reading for us? Sister Silma, are you reading for us? Sister Silma says yes. She's going to read for us. Give her a mic, please. Revelation chapter 4. They think we haven't seen him. I'm going to show you. God the Father is beautiful. Look at it. And we only got a glimpse through dark eyes. We didn't see him good yet. But one of these days. Sister Silva, you ready? She's ready. After this I looked. Mm -hmm. And behold, a door was opened in heaven. Mm -hmm. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And one sat on the throne. There was a throne, and there was a person, a being, sitting on the throne. Let's see what else we can find. And he that sat was to look upon at like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So he was like a jasper. Poor John. Poor John is lost for words. <laughs> John can't really make up his mind. Uh, and, and he, a masculine gender, masculine pronoun, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine. Have you ever seen a jasper stone? It has so many different colors, you can't figure out which it is. And a sardine stone, have you ever seen a sardine stone? It's bright red and lo lo luminescent. John, make up your mind. <laughs> but he can't. And then round about him was the rainbow as an emerald. When you are done, go into your devices and look up sardine stone and jasper stone and emerald. Beautiful. His name, he was like jewelry. He was like the most beautiful jewelry. And apparently he, he changes color. He's not just one fixed dead color like the chair. It's as if he's iridescent. Have you ever seen the, the, the birds with, when you look at them from one angle, they look green and then they look blue and then they look gold? Apparently it's like that. His color is just moving. And with, and with the reflection of the rainbow. Absolutely, imagine. Oh, he's beautiful. I'm sure. So, in the center is beauty and strength. He's strong. Uh, Psalms 20 and verse 1 and 2. The Lord heareth in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. He's powerful. He has strength and he's beautiful. The sanctuary cast down is his sanctuary whom the Romans magnified themselves against. 
And Seventh-day Adventists, none should ever forget this. Any other doctrine is inserted by some evil mind. The sanctuary of strength. Where is the sanctuary today in the world except we obscure Adventists? I remember one elder came to me a long time ago. Forrest, do you really believe there's a sanctuary in heaven? So what is wrong with this man? Does he read the book of Hebrews? All the 1.2 billion Catholics, do they know there's a sanctuary in heaven? Isn't it obscure? Isn't it blocked from their vision in heaven? The sanctuary cast down is his against whom Rome magnified herself, which was the Prince of Hosts, Jesus Christ. And Paul teaches that his sanctuary is in heaven. And nobody sees it. Nobody knows of it. Some the Adventists, the, the, the repositories of God's secret, have rejected it. And like Lot, they have looked on the veil of Sodom, Jordan, and it's so green and flourishing. They said, Abraham, you, you, take, you stay up on the mountainside. We are going down to the plains. Think I'm joking? Go check who in your church got, got passed of the year and find out who he uses in his programs. The likes of me couldn't even sweep out his church. Is the sanctuary Rome, as some have said, seven day Adventists included? The word sanctuary comes from the Latin sanctus, which means sacred. That's what sanctuary means, a sacred place. God told us earlier in scripture that his presence will sanctify the place, make it holy. He says, those of you who are not Levites and priests, and sanctify, don't touch anything. You will die. True or not? True. What happened to us? Yeah. Dead. Santario means a sacred place. This word cannot properly be used and is never used in the scriptures of a common or profane place. The term sanctuary of strength cannot possibly refer to pagan Rome. For how could that which was the most corrupt and vile of all earthly organizations be polluted? It just doesn't make any sense. You know, one thing I've learned about the Bible since I've been studying the Bible a long time ago, it makes sense. When you get it, it's so crystal clear and beautiful. Even when he does strange things like use a slingshot to shoot a warrior like Goliath, it still makes sense. You notice he didn't shoot him on the shoulder, right in the forehead. Can a stone shoot in the forehead, knock you out? Absolutely. Can 300 men with torches and trumpets making confusion make 85,000 men go berserk? Absolutely. So when you get it, it's so crystal clear. There's no confusion. The truth is clear. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can you make room? Have you read about what happened in these places? When they had their feast days, the people feasted and gorged themselves. And when they were filled, the feast is not over. They went out and they had provided for them vomitous bowels. You go out and you disgorge what you have eaten and go back and feast again. And when you went into the temple and you had one girl and you were done, you see ten more. You choose another one. Babylon. And you're going to pollute these places. <clears throat> Rome was the very symbol of moral and spiritual wickedness and decay. Martin Luther, the first Protestant, 
crawling on his knees doing penance on the 100 steps in Rome, heard a voice which says, The just shall live by faith. He had studied it, it was in his head. The Holy Spirit brought it back to his remembrance. And he said, When he saw the wretchedness in Rome, he said, this can never be the gates to heaven. This is the very gates of hell itself. One visit to Rome convinced him of that. If there was a mistake Martin Luther made in regards to being Catholic, was to visit Rome, his own headquarters. Eyes open. Eyes open. This ain't, this ain't heaven. This is no gate to heaven. Somebody deceived me. And then he heard the voice. God waited until he saw the ugly of Rome. Then God said, The just shall live by faith. Get up off your knees. 100 bruises on your knees up that step in. Go earn your salvation. Get up. That was the end of him being a Catholic. You know the rest. It's there. Rome was a very symbol of moral and spiritual weakness and decay. And at the time of this prophecy was not even strong from a physical viewpoint. Prior study to this showed how the, uh, the Visigoths and the rulers had inundated Rome and weakened Rome. What was being overrun and broken to pieces by the barbarians from the north. Only sacred things and places can be polluted and profaned. See Malachi 1, 7. Malachi 1, verse 7. Someone read for us, please. Malachi 1, 7 and 12. We are doing Bible study. We mix in some history. But the standard is the word of God. Malachi 1, 7 and 12. The burden of the word of the Lord. Malachi 1 7. You offer polluted bread. What is bread? The word which really symbolizes the word. What is a symbol of? Jesus Christ. I am the bread of life. Your father said, Manna in the wilderness. You thought it was Moses who gave it to them. It was me. It was of me. I am the bread of life. Verse 12. But ye have profaned it. You have profaned it. In that he say, the table, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. So you have profaned um, God's place. Malachi 2.11. Scoot down one, chapter 2, verse 11. Judah has dealt treacherously. Judah has dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel. And an abomination is committed in Israel. Mm -hmm. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord. Which he loved. Which he loved. And have married the daughter of a strange God. And have married the daughter of a strange God. God's people, Judah in wedlock with the daughter of a strange woman what does the bible say about strange woman in um the book of proverbs i think chapter verse uh chapter seven her mouth drips with honey but her head in there thereof is the way of death the heavenly sanctuary is the place and source of strength the psalmist declared thy way O god is in the sanctuary the Lord send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion because strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. See Psalm 77, 13, 22, and 96, 6. The heavenly sanctuary where God dwells and Christ ministers can alone be the sanctuary of strength. And this is where we find the daily, the tamid, the continual. Not in Rome, not in any pagan temple anywhere. Malachi 7, 1 verse 7, he offered polluted bread upon mine altar, 
and he say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that he say, the, the table of the Lord is contentable. But you have profaned it. Malachi 2 11, Judah, their treacherous. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Question, have Seventh-day Adventists done this? Sadly. Yes. Yes, we have joined ourselves to strange women. The epitome of worldliness dances in our church, calling me to worship God. <coughs> when you see a woman like that, what do you want to do? Worship? Huh? Men, this is your question. The woman can't answer this one. Don't worry about this. Oh, brother, yes, Claudia is not. Yes, sir. He's off the hook. <laughs> When you see a woman like this, if you are attracted to her, is it to worship? The men are timid to answer. Sister Pinock is nearby. And Sister Lori is at the back. So you answer. Answer for the men. If you see a woman like that, we are presuming you are a clean man, so this is theoretical. And you are attracted to go join with her. Is it to worship? No. no. To dance. Huh? To dance. Party. Yeah. To dance. Yeah. Yeah. And dance merely to other things, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> In church. You know, I showed somebody this picture and told them this was a Sabbath morning. And they, they wouldn't believe me. I wouldn't believe you either. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't believe. No. Impossible. I wouldn't leave you either. Like you, you you would have to you would have to show them the video right. and let her go before the podium and they see the Adventist church, the new sign. And then probably after that they will believe you. And they Clovis and Catholicism shall pollute uh, symbiosis of church and state. They shall work together now. The center of strength of strength should read the rock as it is rightly translated in Hebrew. The rock of course is none other than Jesus Christ. So the phrase sanctuary of strength can be interpreted the sanctuary of Christ. Ironically those who say this is a pagan sanctuary have never been able to explain how one pollutes a pagan sanctuary. Since the prophecy is now well down in the Christian dispensation the text must mean the sanctuary of the new covenant. Because the old sanctuary is gone a long time. So which sanctuary do we have? You pause on me again. This is supposed to flow. Exactly. The heavenly sanctuary that Paul spoke of in the book of Hebrews. The one that Moses was given as a copy to make the earthly sanctuary. The one pitched by God and not man. The text must mean the center of the new covenant, the temple of God in heaven. Is it being obscured? Prophecy fulfilled, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Revelation 11, 19. Into this sanctuary, Christ entered after his ascension to carry forward his continual mediation, which was the anti-type, the real thing, the anti-type of the daily ministration of the earth, the temple. Revelation 19, 11. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Absolutely. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. The sanctuary of the new covenant, the temple of God in heaven, Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Have boldness. Jesus entered and we must go in with him. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us 
through the veil, that is to say, his own flesh, through himself. Let us therefore, Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain what? Mercy and find grace in time of need. This is the sanctuary in use today where Jesus ministers he himself. The heavenly sanctuary is the fort, the stronghold, the refuge, the fortress of the saints. When we die in this sanctuary, you can't consign us to hell. When we live in this sanctuary, you can't defeat us. But I, that is why I'm such a hopeful person. Because back of all that transpired this past week, there is one standing watching over his children. He doesn't shield us that we are not tempted. Remember, the three Hebrew boys went into the fire. Daniel went into the lion's den. What the devil did to him, did he? Absolutely. The heavenly sanctuary is the fort, the stronghold, the refuge, the fortress of the saints. They enter, worship, and dwell there by faith. If you don't believe in the heavenly sanctuary, how can you enter it? So if you are not in the sanctuary, if you are not in the fort, the stronghold, the refuge. Where are you? Is it why all their songs end at the cross? Everything at the cross? It's always about the cross. They can go no further. I'm not diminishing the cross. But Paul said, if Christ is not risen, your faith is vain. Christ is not risen. We are dead in our sins. Because salvation didn't stop on Friday. It went through the south with Jesus sleeping, resting in the tomb. And it came back Sunday morning in power and strength. When Jesus arose, the process continued. How did Rome and the apostles of Christianity, how did Rome and the apostles of Christianity should joint, pull, jointly pollute the sanctuary? How did they? Malachi 1 said, He offered polluted bread upon mine altar and say, Wherein have we polluted it? By offering polluted bread. That is why you have to be careful. You and your loved ones, where you eat bread. It was only on the Sabbath day that the bread in the sanctuary was changed. Fresh bread. If you came on Sunday, it wasn't fresh bread. It was yesterday's bread. Polluted bread. So what they are serving now. Be careful where you go. Be careful who you listen to. Polluted bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. John 6 and verse 48. In Jeremiah 34, 16. But he turned and polluted my name. And caused every man his servant. And every man his handmaid. Whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure. To return and brought them into subjection to be unto you the servants. And the four handmaids. You have made my people slaves. You of sin have made my people slaves. We are supposed to read Ezekiel 20. But we do not have sufficient time. We will continue next week. You have made my people slaves. So your assignment this week is to read Ezekiel chapter 20. Read it more than once. Massage it in your minds. Masticate it. Don't read it fast. Suck on it. Go into each word. And look how they have polluted. We have polluted God's people. Um, words fail me when I think about these things. <laughs> Truly fail me.
It's so amazing. It's so clear. Yet nobody sees it. Or people don't want to see it. But I think it's time for us to give God thanks. Before we close our service today, let us give him thanks. Did God give you some light today? Not from Brother Forrest. From his word. Amen. Did he give you some light today? Amen. Are you happy you gathered with the saints to worship today? Amen. Are you taking home your burdens? Or can you go home with a light heart that Jesus has taken your burdens from? By faith. Amen. Let us use the next uh, few moments to tell God thank you for what he has done for you. I have told him thanks for what he has done for me. What I have today, brethren, is priceless. That's how I categorize it. It's priceless. It's priceless what God has given to me. I hope that you share the same sentiments.